Sorry, I've been having some network issues today. Uh, so, um, so our plan today is uh, I'm going to continue on. Um, we kind of did a bit of a introduction to linear regression last time, so we're going to continue on with that. Uh, so most of the time today, I want to spend talking about gradient descent um, and um, a few other issues. So um, I don't know if um, um, so we are working up to assignment three. I, I did only give two weeks again for assignment three, so it's not due. It's due a week from tomorrow. Uh, so I, hope, I think I've seen uh, a few people anyway. Uh, definitely a lot of people have accepted it. I see a few people have been uh, uh, making commits and doing some work on it. Um, we will go into the specific specifics of it. We haven't quite gotten up to the stuff yet. I don't think we'll quite get it up there today, but we need to talk about what we mean by polynomial regression um, and some other issues like that. But, but we first need to kind of get through uh, finishing up how linear regression works, how the cost function works, um, and some other things. So, um, so yeah, I think I'll just jump right into that. Uh, we... Uh, um, uh, last time, uh, just to review a little bit, we had gone through the cost function, um, and um, uh, we talked about the, the mean squared error and the mean absolute error. Um, I don't know if we give a convincing enough argument about why, if you if you find the line for linear regression that has the smallest uh, mean squared error. Um, uh, in some sense, that's going to be the best line. That's going to be the line that, that minimizes the error for the function. But you know, as we showed, um, I mean, you know, you can come up with a cost function. So, does the mean absolute error would it be better, or would the mean square error be better? Uh, where better means you have a better model in terms of make, being able to make predictions and things like that, right? So I won't exactly go. I won't go into that. Um, 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 yeah, there, there can be some trade-offs and things like that, but the, the mean squared error is used uh, quite a bit. So, so it's, it's, it's the normal one that's used for a regression problem most of the time. Um, and uh, yeah, and it does give, you know, in some sense it will give uh, kind of about the best predictions that you can do if you're trying to fit a linear model to the data. Okay? So that, that was where we were at. We, we talked about how you calculate the mean squared error last time. Uh, we've gotten up to the normal equation. I'm going to come back to this, um, so I want to uh, I want to jump into the gradient descent, and then if we have some time, I'll come back, uh, maybe talk about uh, this section of the normal equation uh, if you haven't read it yet. So let's um, the what we haven't done yet. We we came up with a cost function. Uh, and we made the argument that you'll just have to accept if you don't quite believe it, that um, if you can find the line, which means if you can find the set of what, we, what we're now calling the theta parameters that gives the lowest possible uh, mean squared error, uh, that will give you the best model in terms of being able to uh, make predictions with it. All right? So, but, but, as of yet, we don't really have the way, so how do you find the best set of theta parameters, right? So in the simplest case, when you only have one feature, we need just two parameters, like we talked about, the, the, um, the slope uh, and the intercept, right? One feature uh, that you're trying to predict one regression label, you need two parameters. If I have two features, I would need three parameters. So you, need, you always need one more theta parameter um, than uh, the number of features that you have, okay? Um, and uh, um, to go back to one more thing that we looked at last time, um, I'm pretty much going to be using this formalization that, that most people use and that Dr. Ng uses if you watch his videos. So, you know, we're now thinking of the, the general case when we want to do a linear regression. I've got n features labeled 1 through n. Um, so that means that, that I need to figure out the, 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 the theta parameter, if we're going to just call those theta, I need actually n plus one of those uh, because you, have, you always have the bias term or the intercept term plus you have to have one of these parameters for each one of the features. So it, it's really a, a weighting or scaling, a linear scaling factor for each of the, the, the features that you're going to try to build a model on, right? 
So, um, so anyway, keep this this formalism in mind. So we're we're basically using this. Uh, so theta is our parameters. Um, 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 X is going to be our input. We'll have some number in of uh, features, one, two, three, to n features. Uh, M is the number of samples that we have. Um, y are our labels, and Y hat is the prediction. So, so if you have a set of your theta parameters, um, I can just plug in and make a prediction for any uh, inputs, what my predicted output would be, like my predicted house price. Okay. Um, but yeah, getting back though, you know, there's an infinite number of lines. So there's an infinite number of set of theta parameters. So how do you find the one that gets the lowest cost? Right? And that's the whole uh, point of this, right? So this is some important stuff to understand, at least intuitively, uh, from this class. Because a lot of machine learning models work in a similar way. So you can set up a cost function. You can use an optimization method then to uh, minimize that cost function and define the set of theta parameters that give you the lowest possible cost, which should give you the best model, the best predictive model that you can get. Okay? So let's build up uh, intuition if you haven't uh, gone through this notebook. Um, so let's simplify even more than what we did before. So let's assume that we have a set of points. We have a set uh, of points here that we're using in our first example uh, that has a slope of 1 and an intercept of 0. And in fact, we're only going to consider models that go through the uh, an intercept of 0. So, um, 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 so we're, we're not going to be changing the intercepts, and we're not going to be sliding the line up and down. We're just going to consider um, all models like with a slope of one, like we have here, but, uh, but like a, a model with a slope of a half, or a model with a slope of zero, a horizontal line, or a model with a slope of two, right? So, so we're, we're always going to keep the, the, the theta zero as zero, but, and, and try and explore different values of the slope, theta one, here, right? Um, and we're, we're just using a very small data set. So all of our point, we've got just four points. Uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. So they're all, uh, and in fact, since all of them actually are on a line, there is one model that will have a cost of 0, right? So uh, if, um, um, like in our noisy data that we had before, you can't actually get to a cost of 0 when you fit a line to that because the only time you'll have an actual cost of 0 is if everything on the model you're trying to fit exactly is on the, the model line come up with, right? So when that when that's not possible, like when you have noisy data, which is the normal case, uh, your the lowest cost that you can get uh, is going to be somewhere above zero. So so you'll you'll have always have some errors. So so your lowest your best model still has a non-zero cost, right? But on this one, um, just for these four data points, since they actually do fit on a line that goes through uh, uh, the intercept point of zero. Um, we can actually get a cost of zero if we use the line with an intercept of zero and a slope of one, right? But we can get non-zero bigger costs if we uh, try and have lines with different slopes, which is, was, which is all we're doing here, right? Um, so, so this is our first version of a cost function. So this one, is simply taking our inputs x and the labels uh, and the and some set of theta parameters. And in this case, uh, if you look at what we're doing, is we only pass in a, a, a vector that has one value, right? Which is going to be theta one. So we're always in this first version, we're always assuming theta zero is zero, but we're going to be able to vary the slope. Uh, and calculate the cost. Okay, uh, and we're, we're you know if, if you look at this function, I encourage you to make certain you understand these functions that are in this notebook here. Um, but if you look at this, I mean, all we're doing is calculating the mean squared error, the the sum of the squared errors, and then we're uh, uh, averaging them, so we're getting the mean of them, right? So we did this before. So basically, if you take that theta times your x values. Um, did I, did I mention this before? We're, we're really doing a, a, a matrix vector multiplication here, right? But this does what we want to do. So it multiplies each theta times each corresponding input, uh, and then it sums up those, 
right? Um, um, and here, we're, uh, I mean, you know, later on, we'll add in so that we can have theta zero, but we're only passing in the, the slope value uh, when we're calculating our errors, right? Well, this, this gives us the predictions, and then the errors is the, is the differences. We're reviewing a little bit from Tuesday. The, the errors is just the, the difference between those. The errors can have positive or negative magnitude, so we really need something that changes those into how big the magnitude is of the error for all of the samples. So we've only got uh, an M of four samples in our first uh, example here. So we've only got four points um, on this line that we're going to fit. Uh, let me rerun this stuff here. Sorry. So I meant to run, rerun everything up to this point so we can uh, start from here. So yeah, we've only got basically our our, si our number of samples is, is four here. We've got four points that we're fitting data to. All right. Um, so, you know, whether you understand completely yet or not what's going on in that function, <coughs> you should understand the um, <coughs> um, the point here is that that with that function, I can just say what is the cost for a particular model, and our models only have one parameter, the, the slope. Uh, and and you know the best you can do is a slope of one that will give you a cost of zero because all, all the errors will be zero and when you sum them up you'll get a, a zero for the cost the total cost the total average cost right? um, so that's that's why you get zero back um, uh, when you call the cost function for a slope of one but any slope that's not one there's going to be a bit of an error right so uh, a slope of 1.1 1 .1, again I really need to something like a draw on these. So slope of 1.1 is a line that's still going through this, the, the, the zero intercept, but it's a, a slightly bigger slope, right? So we'll have no error here, but we'll have a little bit of error here, bigger error, and a, and a bigger error on that one, right? And so in fact, the, the sum of the squared errors, the mean of the squared errors um, is 0 0.035 when we do a slope of 1.1. Right. And since we're squaring, you'll never get a negative, right? So I don't know, you should intuitively understand that. So the, the minimum cost you can have is zero, but uh, whenever you have errors, when we square those values, they're always going to be positive, and the sum and average of those is going to be some value zero or bigger uh, for the, the mean square error. Right. So you know, we can get some other examples. So the, the bigger, the further away the slope is, either more or less than one, the bigger the error is going to be. Right, so for 0.5, uh, we get that error. And if we have a slope of 2, we get 3.5 is the error. Right? In fact, the, one of the reasons why we wrote the this first version of the cost function like this is it, it's a vectorized um, function. So um, you know, we can pass in more than one hypothesis. So we can pass in many slopes. So here, um, as our first example of that, to build up the intuition, we're, we're passing in uh, what, seven different slopes uh, from negative one to three. Um, and we chose this because it also includes one, the one that's going to give uh, the, the perfectly fit line with an error of zero. Right. So, uh, but, but yeah, so the, the, the function, because of, you know, we're doing like a matrix ve vector multiplication um, and using vectorized operations, uh, will return the cost for every one of the theta parameters which you can th these are high, you can think of these as hypotheses. So these are all um, 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 uh, potential candidates for theta for the slope that we want to test against each other. Right? So we get things ranging from 14 down to zero. Uh, when we go either uh, to you know, negative one for the slope up to to three, so it's a two above the slope. Right. Um, so, you know, ultimately this allows you to visualize what's happening, right? So if, if you plot those, as you should expect if you're following that, so, so we're plotting the cost versus our different hypotheses of the slope, of the theta, right? So when theta gets the perfectly fitting line, which has a, a slope of theta 1 of, of 1, you get a cost of 0. But anything that doesn't have a slope of 1, it's a larger and larger cost 
the further away it is from the best fitting line here, the one with the slope of one that has no error. Okay. Um, and if you follow that, I mean, you know, the the cost function is uh, is a quadratic. It's 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 really squaring the errors. So really, this is a quadratic function, right? Which is clear if you uh, plot this with a higher resolution. So here now we're, we're doing theta um, hypotheses. We're doing 101 hypotheses from negative one to three. But so you can see it's a nice, smooth quadratic function that has a minimum at one um, uh, of zero, a minimum cost of zero. Right? And um, I'll, I'll probably keep emphasizing this, but the that's the by using the, the mean squared error, uh, your cost function always looks like that, even if, if we're having a very high dimensional space, right? So it's going to form a, a convex space like this that has one minimum, right? And that minimum represents the place where, for all the, the, the values of theta, where you get the smallest cost possible when you fit a linear function um, um, using the mean squared error. Okay? Kind of an important uh, uh, concept to visually understand. Right? So, um, uh, for these simple data points, you know, we, we get this as our um, um, uh, relationship between different hypotheses and the the cost. Okay, we still have it though. So, so again, out of the infinite number of values of theta one, um, how do we find the one that will give us the minimum cost? And so, I mean, you know, it, it, it's obvious when you plot it out what it is. If you know a little bit of calculus, uh, if you remember, you might have done this in, in calculus before. I, I don't remember. But if you can uh, take the derivative of your function, so, so here I have a similar function, just uh, uh, x squared minus 2x plus 1 gives the same kind of quadratic uh, that has a minimum at 1, right? And so the derivative of, of x squared minus 2x plus 1 is what? Is, um, um, is um, uh, 2x minus 2, right? So the derivative of that is 2x minus 2. So anyway, the, the, so when you do this analytically using calculus, um, uh, if you can take the derivative of the function, all you have to do is then find the place where that function is 0. Uh, and that's going to be either a minimum or a maximum, right? And since our mean squared error is a quadratic, is, is a something to the power of 2, the same thing works for that, right? So I don't have to, to uh, examine all of the infinite number of these. I can analytically find a solution uh, by taking the derivative, um, 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 setting that to be 0, and solving. Uh, and that will tell me the place where the minimum or the maximum occurs for my... Uh, quadratic in this case. Right. That that's really uh, to, to go back. I mean, that's really the answer to what the um, the normal equation is doing. So, um, if we're using the mean squared error, we can uh, find an expression that um, basically is the derivative of the matrix, the linear algebra formulation of the mean squared error, set it to zero, and solve for the thetas that minimizes that. Okay? And, and I'll come back to that, but that's really what the normal equation is doing. Okay? But so sometimes, though, you can't solve things analytically, so some optimization problems aren't quite so smooth, or you may, might not be able to take the derivative of. So we're talking about an alternative method here, which is an iterative method uh, called gradient descent. Okay. Um, although gradient descent uh, still uh, relies on the fact that we need to be able to calculate the derivative, the gradient, at any point. Okay. But the idea for gradient descent is, I, if I just start at some place at random, let's say we start at a theta of zero. If I know, if I take the, the derivative, I know the derivative is negative here because the slope, uh, the derivative is really just the, the slope of the tangent line at the point of your function. Um, uh, so since the derivative is negative, that means that I have to go, I have to be, go a value bigger. So, so the, the, the function, um, I have to go in this direction uh, to follow the curve where it's going, where it's going down, getting lower. Right? So, um, so I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but that's kind of the way gradient descent. So if I start here, 
if I calculate the derivative, um, I can maybe take a step size of like 0 0.1 or 0 0.5, right? Um, so since the derivative is negative, I add 0 0.1, whatever my step size is, and try again, right? Um, and by doing that, I can follow uh, the slope of my cost function to try and get down to where the minimum is, right? Um, and that kind of gradient descent uh, works uh, even for messier functions. Uh, and it works as long as I can have some idea of locally which direction I need to go to, to, to follow uh, the curve down to smaller costs, right? So something like a derivative you need to be able to do um, at each point here, okay? But, uh, yeah, we'll come back to that. So, um, so, let's see. Um, oh, uh, so let's start making this more realistic. Uh, so let's add back in uh, where I might vary both of the two parameters, right? So I'll still have a, a line that has one feature, uh, but let's say, you know, we've got both the slope and the intercept. So we want to fit a model uh, that has the slope and the intercept. So when I have two parameters, um, I can't really visualize it like this anymore because I need to have uh, two dimensions, theta zero and theta one, and plot the cost on the third dimension uh, as theta zero and theta one vary, all right? So, uh, so we can't really visualize um, on a plane anymore, but we can visualize if we do like a three dimensional plot uh, still if I just have theta zero and theta one, two parameters. Which is, which is kind of what we're working up to here, right? So um, in this version, I don't, don't know if I was clear enough when I described it uh, in the lecture notebook, but we added back in. Um, so, so now we're using just, again, a made-up line, but that has a slope of 1 again, that has uh, an intercept of 1. So the, the, this line was just shifted up by 1. To, I don't know if I plotted it. Um, Uh, so it's mostly the same line, but the intercept was at 1 instead of 0, right? Um, and we're going to do the, the, the same argument, but we want to uh, plot the, uh, the, the cost function again, but we want to visualize it both as a, um, a parameter of, of the two theta parameters we have, both of the uh, slope and the intercept, instead of just the one parameter that we were doing. So the only modification for this function is it now doesn't assume that, uh, you know, that the intercept is zero. So it makes the predictions using, um, it's expecting two parameters, theta zero and theta one, the slope and the intercept. Okay. Um, so we use, uh, you'll probably, we'll use this trick uh, a couple times here to visualize stuff using what's known as a contour plot. Uh, so we're building up uh, what, what, uh, NumPy calls a mesh grid. This is really just all combinations. So, so theta zero, we're going to vary from zero to two. Uh, so remember, you know, the, 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 the minimal cost happens for these four points uh, when theta zero is one and theta one is one. So we'll just go from zero to two both for theta zero and zero to two for theta one uh, and combine these. So, you know, um, this, um, I don't mean this to be mysterious. This is just all combinations of theta zero and theta one. Um, so like if you look at, um, the first 101 points, uh, so we've got what, two rows, but 101 columns. Um, so that's too many to see, let's do the first 11. So yeah, I mean, the, the first row in this are the theta zero values, I believe, and the second one is the theta one. So for, for when, whenever theta one is zero, we're doing all the combinations from zero to two in this mesh grid, right? Um, and uh, if we transpose that, we, we use the transpose when we, um, uh, when we calculate the multiplication of these here. Uh, but yeah, you might more easily see that. So the first 11 values in the mesh grid is uh, what, uh, theta one is theta zero, theta zero. But you know, eventually all combinations of theta one, theta zero are in here. That, that's all that mesh grid does. Right? Uh, but since we have this 
function vectorized, um, I can calculate the cost for all of those from one function call, right? So this call here um, is calculating all of the cost, uh, the, the size of this. There was actually, what, 10,201 combinations uh, where we have 101 uh, grid point values for theta zero and 101 for theta one. So 101 times 101 is 10,201. Um, so, so we could plot this as a three-dimensional plot. We're, we're first doing a, a contour plot here. So we're doing the same thing we did on the first figure, but we've now got two parameters, theta zero and theta one. We're plotting the cost, um, and so the contour plot um, uh, interpolates, smooths it out, uh, so you can see the uh, uh, different cost from zero to so, so the dark red is a cost of zero up to we've got a cost of eight, uh, some of the highest costs that we have uh, over this range here. Right? So you know, to read this, this is saying that if theta zero is zero and theta one is zero, uh, the cost is eight, right? uh, using this co the, the colors on the contour plot. Right? And you know, we should have a minimum of zero down here when theta zero is one and theta one is one, because that, that was the data that we were using um, um, in our function uh, uh, now using both parameters here. So our four points have an intercept of one and a slope of one in this case. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, uh, because these are uh, changing um, relatively uh, 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 quickly here. If we just take the log, we can get a better uh, view of the contours. So this is just the log of the costs instead of the costs that we had before. But you can e more easily see that, um, uh, so the, the blue is down to zero of cost and, and then the log of the cost um, is being plotted out here on the contours. But it, it's still at one one is kind of the point of this one. So, um, by the way, there, there's a way, I, to, I couldn't get it working today, there's a way to get it so that you can um, uh, get an interactive version of like a 3D plot so you can rotate and scale and stuff, uh, but yeah, you have to install some things. So if I get that working, I'll uh, post about that. So, but, but really, this contour plot is the same as we're doing here. Um, uh, it's a little, maybe a little bit tough to see, but in, in three dimensions, right? So uh, again, at, at one, one for theta zero, theta one, it comes down to zero. It's pretty pretty sharp the way it goes down there, so you end up with kind of a bowl shape. Um, but um, um, that's kind of what we're trying to show um, uh, in this plot here. Um, so the next example here, we go back to using the, um, um, the, the house data that we used on, the, uh, on Tuesday on the previous data set. So uh, again, you know, I, I want you to build up a, a intuition for what's being done here for gradient descent. Okay? So we can kind of do a gradient descent by hand. Uh, let, me, um, um, let me pause the animation here. Okay? So uh, I won't go through all the, the code step by step. But what we're basically doing is the first plot that happens here in the animation, um, or you know, this orange line, is we first plot um, a line that has what an uh, intercept of 1,600 and a slope of negative 0.15. If, if you remember back to Tuesday, that house data, um, when we used the polyfit or the other linear regression models, it came back with an intercept of 71.2 and a slope of about 0.13 something. Uh, was the best fitting line using the, the, the mean squared error uh, for the cost function. Right? Um, so in, in, in this data, so if we visualize that, uh, so this is the data. So if we have a line that has a negative slope, negative 0.15, and an intercept of 1600, it's that line there. Right? So and then we can, we can figure out what the cost of that line is. So the cost of that line ends up being over here. So um, if we plot um, theta 0 and theta 1 at 1,600 and negative 0.15, we get a cost of um, 
Um, I should have put the color bar on there, so but, but we get a, a high cost, okay? Um, so, uh, looking at this here, when we just did the first one, so the way gradient descent would work is um, if I could calculate the gradient with respect to each of my theta parameters, I can tell which direction I should go to, to get closer to the minimum, right? Um, and we're doing this in two dimensions, but this works for however many dimensions that you have, right? So I've got two dimensions because I have one feature. Uh, so I need one feature, I need the intercept term. Uh, that gives me two parameters I'm trying to fit. If, I, if my number of, of features is 10, I just have 11 dimensions. Uh, but, uh, but in order to do gradient descent, I just need to be able to calculate the, the derivative with respect to each one of my features. Uh, and I can step in the right direction for gradient descent. So here, um, if you look, um, maybe this one is better. So, so here, if we start here, if, I, if I'm just thinking about theta zero, um, um, if you look at these contours, you'll see that they're getting smaller if you go this direction to about here. They're going to get larger if I go that direction. So I should make a step um, along theta zero back this way. So I, I, I should subtract from 1600 to move towards uh, smaller values of the cost. Same, same if I'm looking on this theta one dimension, uh, it's, it's getting bigger, so maybe a little bit tougher to see, but, but if I'm going in this direction, the costs are getting bigger looking at the contours. If I go in this direction, they're actually getting smaller. Um, so I need to make a step back this way on theta one, so, so my slope needs to go less negative is kind of what's happening here. Okay. Um, and so on. So, so what we're kind of showing is uh, we just did this by hand. We kind of did a gradient descent by hand here. Um, so you know, this was our first one. So, uh, so both of these, if we take a step in the right direction like I was just describing, um, our next one uh, ends up here, um, and so on, right? So the last one in the sequence was the actual uh, close to the best uh, intercept and slope that we had. So the 71.2 intercept and the 0.13 slope, right? But you can see with that, so from our initial starting point, we had like a negative slope, so it got less and less until it became positive. So um, um, on this one here, it was zero, or horizontal line, and then a little bit more and more positive. Right? Um, and if I had displayed the cost for each of these, you know, so it was, it was looking at the contours, it was a high cost here, uh, and it was getting smaller and smaller for each of these steps until we got down to close to zero. Um, okay, so if you kind of followed that, I mean, that's really all gradient descent is. Uh, the tricky part being that, um, so the normal way we implement it is I need to be able to calculate the derivative with respect to each one of the features. From that, from, from the sign of the derivative, um, I need to go in the opposite direction. Um, so, uh, so yeah, back to the first example here. So uh, on this one, if I was at 1.5 um, and the, the, the best cost happens at 1, the derivative is going to be positive here. So I need to go in the opposite direction of the sign of the derivative with respect to my feature. Right? Um, and what we're doing for gradient descent is we just take small steps. So back to this uh, one here. So you can imagine if your step is too big, um, gradient descent will diverge. Okay, so that's one of the things that's discussed uh, in the readings on this chapter. So if if, if even if I calculate the derivative correctly, if, I, if I'm taking a step like of 2,000, I'll go from 1,600 to uh, or maybe even bigger. But but I'll go to somewhere that's that instead of being at a smaller cost, ends up being a bigger cost. So the, the, that's called the learning rate for gradient descent. Um, and that's something that you have to um, set correctly. If it's too big, you'll start diverging. So, so, uh, so that's, that's how you know if your learning rate is too big. If you start running gradient descent and the cost gets bigger instead of getting smaller, 
that means you have to make your learning rate uh, uh, a lot smaller. But, uh, but learning rate can be too small. So if learning rate is too small, basically I'm taking really, really small steps. So it might take forever to actually converge and get down to the lowest cost, right? So, uh, so finding the right learning rate um, um, is a little bit of an art, although um, later on this course, there, we, you won't have to really do gradient descent by hand. So there are optimizers that we'll be using in scikit-learn that uh, do lots of tricks in order to figure out a good learning rate uh, and to vary the, the learning rate uh, to try and uh, converge as fast as possible um, to find the best value. Right? Uh, so, Uh, so gradient descent is iterative, um, uh, but it is um, um, it is guaranteed to find the solution as long as your learning rate is not too big. So if, if it's converging, and if you let gradient descent run long enough, it will eventually. If you're if you're using um, the the sum squared error, so the sum squared errors are always quadratic. So it will eventually find for linear regression, uh, the you know get down to or get really close to the, the minimum, um, the best data parameters. And it's not always guaranteed. So depending on your cost function, uh, your cost functions might not always be good. Um, you know, have one minimum, um, like like we have for the sum squared error. So in that case, gradient descent might get caught in a local minimum, or there might be other issues. Right, but. For right now, for the uh, cost function we're using for linear regression and logistic regression, it, it, it's a well-defined um, function. It'll always have one minimum. And gradient descent is guaranteed to converge um, always if um, uh, you use a correct learning rate uh, and you wait long enough so that it gets down to um, the, the, the lowest cost um, uh, for the data that you're trying to fit. So, um, all right, and and again, I'll come back. You know, uh, uh, maybe mention the um, uh, the normal equation, right? So there there's trade-offs. So then the normal equation, uh, in order to solve, you can solve this analytically. So if I'm just doing a simple linear regression, um, I can get an exact solution analytically. But it can actually often because you have to take the inverse and do some other stuff. Uh, if I have a large number of features and a large number of samples of data, it can actually take a long time uh, to do this uh, exact solution analytically. So, so, so some, in, in some cases, especially for big data, gradient descent uh, will be a lot faster than trying to solve uh, this um, um, uh, exact equation. Um, but it Onto this, uh, at this point, if you if you looked at this notebook or looked at Dr. Ng's notebook, we begin to really get into uh, kind of some formalization. So I hope this doesn't scare people away. But we're really just um, uh, so you have to know a little bit about derivatives and partial derivatives. It's probably not important that you completely understand all of this, uh, but um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class uh, to uh, to talk about where how this was derived. This is really just the partial derivative of the, um, the, the mean squared error function that we had. Okay? So the mean squared error function that we talked about before, this is its derivative with respect to each one of the parameters. Um, so in this case, i is the sample number. So we're summing, summing over m samples from 0 to m minus 1. But j is the feature number. So um, um, in the data we've looked for so far, we've only got two features the slope and the intercept. So, so in this equation, j is, is either 0 or 1 uh, for just looking at our, our house data with two features. <coughs> hmm, I'm going to be lagging here. <coughs> um, so, So however this is derived, this is saying that um, um, I can calculate those derivatives uh, with respect to each one of those features by just plugging this in. And if you looked at the, this notebook, um, implement that as like a function. 
to calculate the, the, the derivatives of the cost function. We're really, to, to break it down a little bit, you know, we're doing the stuff you already know how to do. So this is calculating the hypothesis. So we're just taking the theta times my in, the derivative. We did something similar to what you would to take the derivative of like the error we had. So we don't have a square function, but the derivative back to parameter j, you just have to multiply the error times that j feature. Uh, and then divide by m to get the average. And that gives you the derivative with respect to parameter zero. So you're going to be dividing by um, the, um, um, uh, uh, the input zero or input one um, uh, each time when you do this. You know. And that gives you. And this is really just uh, notation for you're going to be dividing by um, the um, um, uh, the input zero or input one um, uh, each time when you do this. You know. And that gives you. And this is really just uh, notation for uh, all of these, right? So you can, you can collect all of these into a one single vector, right? So this is the derivative with respect to the theta zero, derivative with respect to theta one, and so on, right? And you can calculate all those in one step by doing that. Um, And again, I won't go through this step by step, but um, that's what this function is doing right here, the gradient function of the mean squared error. Right? So given a theta and given our inputs x and y, uh, this is really doing uh, what was shown here um, and, and uh, here. I don't want to um, So you know, we, we, we do the predictions. Uh, we calculate the errors. Um, and the gradients here, we're just multiplying the inputs times those errors to get the gradients. Uh, and then we're dividing by m, multiply 2 divided by m. Uh, and the result of this is going to be a vector of the gradients. So, uh, so again, if I have two features, I'll have a, a vector of two gradients, uh, the, 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 the um, derivative with, with respect to each one of our features that we have here. All right. So. Um, So, so in this one, I was using a function that had uh, some noise. Oh, uh, yeah, so um, um, go back a little bit. So we're using a function with an intercept of 4 and a slope of 3, but we did add a little bit of noise. So we can't get a cost of 0 anymore, right? So the best function, uh, the best fit probably should have, you know, theta 0, 4, theta 1, a 3. But with the noise, we won't be able to get down to 0. So, but, but yeah, so, so if you feed that into the gradients, um, um, so the, the cost, uh, notice, so we can still do the, the cost function, so the cost is 0.75 uh, for the best data, uh, 4 and 3. Um, um, and this should be the, the, the derivatives with respect to theta 0 and theta 1. Uh, that's coming out of here uh, when we when we just did it with uh, that theta and the inputs x and y that we had there. Okay. So again, since these are both positive, if I want to do gradient descent, um, I would I would want to take a step uh, in the negative direction for both uh, theta zero and theta one. But yeah, the, we were passing in the theta that was giving the minimum um, uh, yeah, the, the, that should have been pretty close to the best that we could do four and three. So these gradients should be pretty small because we should be close to the optimum here. Um, OK. So I, I don't know if, 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 you know, if I'm going too fast or if that's making too much sense or not. But, but from that, if you follow that, batch or gradient descent, the, the basic um, uh, was called batch gradient descent, uh, could be implemented relatively easily, easily if you have uh, a cost function and a gradient function, like we just talked about. Um, so, if we just calculate our gradients, um, all we need to do, uh, so for our current set of theta, so we just start at some random point. 
So in fact, it's pretty common for gradient descent to just start at zero. So all the, the parameters are zero for whatever you're trying to fit, uh, and then just iterate from there. Um, so if you have that, um, um, we can calculate the gradients for all of the inputs for the current set of theta. And from those, those gradients, uh, if you go in the opposite directions, the reason why we're subtracting is to go in the opposite direction of the gradients, but we multiply by the learning rate, which is called uh, eta, eta. Um, uh, you know, so if my gradient is one, eta usually needs to be a value less than one. So if I only, only, only want to take 10% of a step along the gradient, I might set eta to 0.1 or something. So by default, in this example, we pass in a learning rate of 0.1. But the result of, of all of that, you know, we're doing a lot of vectorized stuff here, uh, but uh, this should have a new set of theta where every one we took a small step in the right direction uh, to get closer to the uh, uh, lower cost, so, so to move in the direction of lower cost in our defined um, um, cost function here. Okay. Um, so I think the point of this here is that you should see that this works, kind of, uh, mostly works. Um, so did I have this backwards here? So if we call batch gradient descent, we're still working with the data that had an um, 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 intercept of 4 and a slope of 3. So it didn't get really good, but uh, but uh, yeah. So it came back that it stopped at uh, uh, 3.39 um, and 3.46. So that should have been you know um, our four and our uh, three uh, intercept of four and slope of three there. Uh, but again, you know that, that's because of the noise that um, um, it's not able to get exactly the correct answer, right? So uh, just to prove that. Because I'm because that looked a little bit further off than I was thinking. I don't know if I got have those switched around or not. Uh, but um, this is similar to some of the stuff that we're going to be doing for the polynomial regression for the assignment three. If you haven't started on it yet, so like if I just reduce that noise a bit, let's let's make the noise. Um, So right now, this, this noise that we're adding has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So it's going to be kind of close to being plus or minus one that we add to the uh, output that we're trying to get. So let's uh, multiply that, make it much smaller. So if I multiply by one thousandth, um, it'll be much closer to the true value. Uh, so we won't have much noise. Or I could just remove the noise altogether. Um, Let's leave it in a little bit. So I probably should plot this here too. So um, so, so yeah, I mean, I mean what we had before um, looked more like this when we did the noise. Um, oh, this is an example. I, I should use a, a scatter plot. Um, Right. So with, with the original noise, it was something like that. And the best line had an intercept of 4 and a slope of 3 uh, here. So we'll go down, maybe not quite as much as I was thinking, maybe 1 one hundredth. Um, so here, it's mostly the right arm line, just a little bit of jiggling, a little bit of noise uh, in there. So, um, so you notice that um, uh, when we did the, uh, the gradient function, um, that, that we're much closer to zero here when, when we pass in four and three um, for our uh, parameters. Um, so if we do our gradient descent again, 
So, um, oh, um, yeah, in this case, maybe we're not iterating long enough. So, um, um, uh, I should probably point out, um, so we do. We just keep doing this. Uh, so, so a real op, re, a real implementation of gradient descent would probably want to do something more sophisticated than just doing this ten times or a hundred times, where we take a hundred steps. Right? So, so normally what we want to do is keep track of how close, uh, how small those gradients are, and once they get sufficiently small enough, we stop. Right. So we might not stop until. Our gradients are, uh, you know, uh, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 or something like that. Right? Um, but yeah, maybe we would get better if we just iterate for quite a bit more. Yeah. So, so in the notebook I gave you, I probably wasn't iterating long enough. So if we just keep going, um, um, uh, uh, we will get down to since we don't have any have any much noise anymore, uh, we will get down pretty close to four and three um, uh, using this basic gradient descent here. All right, but yeah, I mean, you know, appreciate what's happening here. So, so given the data um, that we're fitting here uh, and starting in a random place, we're, we're taking steps um, um, and uh, we're finding uh, what the best fitting model is. Um, right. So, um, if I add back in some noise, you know, make it a little bit smaller than I had before. So here I put it back to 0.5, half, half of a unit of standard deviation, so one unit of standard deviation. Um, but uh, I should probably modify the, the examples in the notebook to um, iterate longer. Um, so again, with a bit more noise, if we iterate for 1,000, um, it still gets down, you know, uh, that's a little bit more what I was expecting there. So even, even with... Uh, quite a bit of noise. It gets down pretty close to four and three. Uh, um, so, one thing that's being returned from this is the history of the different parameters that were tried as we did the steps, uh, the cost that was achieved at each one, uh, and the gradients uh, that were calculated at each one of the, the steps in this, uh, this batch. Uh, batch gradient descent here, right? So this is kind of our first introduction to learning curves. Um, so, oh, I know I only did ten is because uh, because yeah, it's a little bit tough to see uh, when we do a thousand. Um, you can't see the, the the learning that occurred. So it took the the, the cost reduced real quickly in the first ten or uh, twenty. Um, iterations and much slower after that. So let's go back and let's only do 10 like we had. I think that's why we had it set to 10 now, if I remember right. Um, so this is kind of an example of a learning curve. Um, um, we'll be doing something like this for assignment 3, although in a slightly different way. So all we're showing here is what the cost was for each of our batch steps. Each of our, our, our gradient descent uh, steps that we did here. All right, so it started off pretty high, but within four or five, it went down to um, this level. Uh, and this is actually the the, the line. Um, so this is plotting out the um, the theta parameters and the theta history. All right, so when we start off with them all zero, we get the horizontal line, um, and um, in our ten steps, we ended up here. Um, so even those those parameters look Kind of off to me, but but you know that, that's really visually pretty close to the line with an intercept of four and a slope of three um, 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 that we use to generate the data. Um, okay, and just to prove, I mean, you know, uh, this was all made up data that we had here, although there was some noise in here, so it's just a little bit more realistic. But we can go back and try this on the house. Uh, data set that we were using on the previous notebook. Uh, so we had like 47 samples in here uh, and, and we had the one feature so we need to fit the, the slope and the intercept um, uh, where the slope is the, the, uh, the modifier for the house size and square feet here. Um, so 
So uh, I won't go through all the discussion of this. You have to be careful of the, um, um, the iterations and the learning rate. Uh, but as is mentioned here, I don't remember if this came from the textbook or not, but um, this doesn't seem to work if you just do it with the batch rate and descent that we have. So if you remember, the, um, the intercept was like 71 and uh, the slope was like 0 0.13 or something like that. So even with a, a very large number of iterations, um, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to get very close. So it's very tough to, to or, or it takes a very long time to converge on this data uh, unless we scale the, 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 uh, the, the parameters because the, um, the, the size in square feet is a bit different uh, in scale than the, uh, the price that we're trying to predict here. So it helps a lot uh, if you want to get an example that works to uh, scale the, uh, the, the um, uh, the square feet to be a value between 0 and 1 here, which is what we do here. But in that case, um, like we say, if, if you want to uh, get back the original uh, theta and 0 and theta 1 before you did scaling, you have to actually take the result that you get uh, from this uh, gradient descent and convert it back into our original scale. Um, and I won't go into the details of that, but um, Oops, uh, but but yeah, if you do the uh, the gradient descent after you scale, um, um, this is actually working. But uh, you won't get the the um, slope and the intercept like we had on the first notebook. Um, but um, uh, if you rescale it back, uh, you will get um, what you're expecting. So, so it's taking a little bit of time here. I do seem to be having some issues again. I'm uh, not running Zoom, so I'm not certain why it's slowing down. Oh, I got. Okay, um, yeah, so, geez. Yeah, I'm finally finished up. So, um, so yeah, that, anyway, that doesn't really look like the right one, but if you rescale back to the original um, um, coordinate system, um, you can kind of convince yourself that it does work, even with um, our somewhat slightly more realistic ones. So that, that's pretty close to the, uh, the optimum that like polyfit or linear regression from scikit-learn is going to give you. But, but yeah, we did have to do a little bit of work to recover back our original um, uh, before scaling um, um, values here. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So I still got 50 more minutes. Um, so. Uh, Probably go a little bit quicker over, uh, just a little bit more here. Um, so that's the basic of gradient descent, uh, and there's actually a complete implementation. Um, there's some variation, so you, you might hear people talk about uh, stochastic gradient descent. Let me just jump right to the stochastic gradient descent. Um, so uh, what we just did before is we calculated the gradients for all of the samples in one step. Okay, so when we were doing the, the, the gradients, uh, we were doing it over all of the, the data that we had. So like 47 samples in our house data set. Um, uh, that works fine as long as your number of samples, the, the amount of data you have is relatively small. So if I have a data set of, of 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 values, I could probably do like a full batch. But once you start getting the big data, if I have millions of samples, um, um, it takes a really long, it, it, it can take too long to, to calculate the gradients to do gradient descent on all the data in one step. Um, so at the other extreme is I can just calculate a, uh, a gradient on just one sample 
uh, one input. And that's what stochastic gradient descent does. So really, it picks one input from the data that you're trying to fit at random, calculates the gradients on that, and takes a step on the, uh, the, the theta parameters based on those gradients. And it just does that. So we keep picking one at random, uh, calculating the gradients to take a step. So it, it's, it's very fast. So since I'm, I'm only calculating the gradients on one input, I can calculate them real quickly. But the problem is, is that, um, 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 so you'll see a lot more noise. So, so when you're doing it over all of the samples, you get a, a kind of you, you get a much better uh, direction of which way I need to move to um, uh, minimize my cost, right? But if, if I only do it for one sample, uh, what's good for that one sample might be not really good overall. In fact, it might be going in the wrong direction, right? So, so really, the right step to go to get the minimum cost. Um, uh, is, is um, a function of all the data. And one data point might be an outlier or something like that. Um, so it might not give you a, a very good idea of which direction to go uh, to get better cost. Right? But anyway, if you look at this, so what normally happens is, um, uh, this is terminology for uh, gradient descent, uh, so for stochastic and, and batch gradient descent. Um, so normally what we do is we want to train for a number of epochs. In each epoch, we're going to train over um, each one of the data points. Although this first version of stochastic gradient descent, um, if you look closely, all we're doing is selecting one of the points at random. So we're not doing selection with, with uh, 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 we're, we're doing selection with replacement. So the, the point being is that we could select the same item multiple times uh, because of what we're doing here, or um, um, for the, the items in our inputs that some of them might not get selected. Uh, you know, it just depends on what happens for this random, uh, uh, random when we select a random index here. Okay, um, but that's okay as like a first um, uh, approximation. Um, so this isn't the way that we normally do stochastic gradient size. So this, this is doing like a random selection with a replacement. So I could end up training within an epoch multiple times on some samples and not using other samples at all. Right? Um, the other thing on this, um, uh, you'll notice uh, if you look at the learning curves um, from the gradient descent, um, it, it's not smooth anymore. Um, so you'll get a lot more jumping around. Right? And that's, again, because I'm, I'm just taking one sample at a time. So sometimes I'm not going in very good directions overall to minimize the cost function. But, but this, is, this is typical of, of stochastic gradient descent, where I'm only taking one or a very small number of samples for each of my gradient calculations. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I can't remember, I probably took this from the, the textbook. So the, the more usual way to do, if I'm doing stochastic gradient descent, is each epoch, um, um, I, so I sample without replacement. So one way to do that is if you take all the indexes, all the samples, and just shuffle them up randomly, uh, and then I take them one by one. So uh, within an, an epoch, here, I'm going to be guaranteed to use every sample that I'm trying to fit one time. Right? So this is, this is the normal way that stochastic uh, gradient descent is done. So we, 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 we're randomly taking the next item to calculate the gradients on, but we only train with everyone once. Um, uh, and we're guaranteed to use everyone once within an epoch of training. And that's what's kind of happening here. Right? But uh, the result is still going to be pretty similar to what we just had before. Uh, it'll still be um, um, uh, much less smooth. So you, get a, you should get a similar, you won't, probably won't be able to see much of a difference um, uh, uh, either, uh, either way. These are both examples of stochastic gradient descent. Um, So uh, I was mixing up my terms here, but the, the, what we'll use a lot, what our textbook uses a lot, um, is what's called mini-batch gradient descent. Okay? So a good 
um, compromise is uh, instead of taking just one or taking all the items, so all the items is problematic. If I have a large data set, uh, might slow things down. Uh, one item uh, can be very noisy, so, so you know, uh, you might wander around a lot before I get down to a good minimum function. So uh, you can't compromise. So you can take a, a, a batch, what's called a mini batch. So I could take 100 items or, or 500 items, whatever works for, you know, your, your data set, the number of features you have, and things like that. Um, so this is an example of mini batch. Um, it's pretty similar to the, the stochastic, uh, but um, so we, we shuffle up the, the indexes randomly like we did for the, the second version of stochastic gradient descent, but instead of taking just one at a time, we take them in batch sizes. So here, batch size like be, by default is 10. It's more typical to be something like 128 or 256 or some power of 2, something like that. Um, but yeah, if you look carefully in here, we are sampling uh, without replacement, uh, but this one ends up taking a batch um, from begin to end, and then we just update these by the batch size. So since the batch size is 10 by default, this will take them in batches of size of 10. Uh, but then we do the same thing we did before. So we um, calculate the gradients, update the thetas on that batch size of 10, and we do that for all the batches. For, and so one epoch epic again, like we did for stochastic, uh, will be guaranteed to uh, do the gradients on all of the values in our sample, uh, uh, if we do it like this. So. Um, the result is that um, this will, batch size 10 might be still a little bit small, but, but you know, the, the, the gradients will look a lot smoother. So even with the batch size 10, we're not getting the, all the, the noise. Um, as we're in our class, as we're filing the gradients down, it smooths it out quite a bit. Um, um, okay, so yeah, so I might have gone a little bit quick through that, but uh, hopefully that uh, the the gradient descent is. Um, um, you really need to get an intuition for what it's doing, okay? So a, a lot of the stuff in machine learning, if, if you just understand this at the high level. So uh, what we do a lot is if we can define a cost function that, that gives us an idea for some proposed solution, uh, you know, whether that solution is good or not, right? So high cost is bad, the, the lower the cost, the better. So once you have a cost function, you can use an optimization method to then search for the parameters to find ones that have lower costs uh, or, or differentiate those from ones that have higher costs, okay? So um, for, you know, for, for simple linear regression, uh, the cost function is relatively simple. Um, so you don't really need gradient descent unless you have a really big set of data that you're trying to fit a linear regression to, right? So in fact, kind of back, back for final time to the normal equation, um, so, uh, so we can do an analytic solution. I think I already described this. So this is really just uh, the same thing like I did uh, uh, here. Uh, so we're taking the, the matrix form. We're taking the derivative of it. So that's, this is really the, the derivative, and we assigned it to 0, and we rearranged it to solve for theta, right? The, the same way that we took the derivative assigned to 0 and rearranged it to solve for x. So if you can solve that, that will give you the, the theta uh, uh, directly that will give you the minimum cost for a linear regression. Right? In fact, you can easily do that by hand. So this notebook shows doing that. So you get the same result. In fact, um, I, don't know, I, I think like polyfit is probably using the normal equation, uh, like if you use polyfit uh, um, from, from the NumPy library. So, um, but yeah, this requires taking the inverse uh, and the transpose of some matrices to, to calculate it. Um, okay, yeah, so there's some more stuff in there, but... Um, um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there for today. Uh, it's 145. Uh, so we still haven't gotten up to the polynomial regression. So we'll get to that next week then. So that will be the main stuff, of course, that you'll need to really understand for the assignment three. But uh, before that, you know, make certain that you do get started on the assignment three um, and come next week with questions. We'll get into details.